Hey! Welcome to another exciting episode of the most wonderful real estate podcast ever. I'm your host, Dwan Benton Twyford. I'm America's most sought after real estate investor. And I have another great guest for you today. So today we'll be doing our guest session where we interview a wicked smart man. And we find out what's happening and what they're doing and how they got there. And ideally, they'll be able to offer some kind of a little tidbit that might unlock something for you that's been holding you back. So our motto at Wonderful is people before profits. So if that resonates with you, you're at the right time. This is the right place. And Garrett is the right man. So Garrett, how are you today? Good. Thanks, Dewan. Pleasure to be with you. <laughs> I'm excited to have you on here today. So folks, this is uh, our wicked smart guy today, Garrett Sutton. And so Garrett, we start off, we always just sort of have a toast and have a little get to know you. So I'm having water, not very exciting. But cheers. cheers. And everybody that watches, take a deep breath, <sighs> stretch, shake off whatever you got going on, and open your mind to having some fun and laugh with us a little bit. And you're also going to be highly entertained and highly educated. So basically, Garrett, the way we like to start off is I like to have uh, my guests just give us very briefly who you are and what you do and how to get a hold of you. And then I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and find out how you got to be Garrick Sutton, best-selling author. <laughs> well, I can do that. Uh, okay. My name is Garrett Sutton. I'm a corporate attorney in Reno, Nevada. Uh, I'm, I've written a number of books in the Rich Dad Advisor series, and uh, we help people set up and maintain LLCs and corporations uh, in all 50 states. So uh, that's what I do. You can reach me at corporatedirect.com. Uh, we offer a free 15-minute consultation uh, with an incorporating special at a cor and specialist at corporatedirect.com. So that's about as brief as I can make it. Dwan. That's perfect. That is so great. Sometimes the briefness is like 20 minutes. I'm like, <laughs> you're not leaving me room to ask questions. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to make sure I have. So uh, corporate training, which I love. Rich Dad Advisor, love that. And you help people with LLCs and corporations uh, around the whole entire United States as corporatedirect.com. That's it. Perfect. Are you on any social medias? Yeah, I mean, uh, I we are. I don't do it. I have someone else that helps someone, me. Someone does it for you, though, because I saw your book. I was thinking I saw it on Instagram. Do you happen to know? Anyway, yeah, this is someone, someone is promoting this new book. Uh, on social media, Veil Not Fail. Yeah, so this is the book, Veil Not Fail. And I was like, Veil Not Fail. So so my mind was like, so it must be like a veil of protection. That's what I thought of first, instead of like a wedding veil, because you know, I'm in the real estate business. I thought, Veil Not Fail. And then I read what it said. And I said, ooh, that sounds like, that sounds like this is something I need to talk to. Well, you do, because uh, the veil will protect you if you get sued. But if you don't follow these rules, they can pierce through the veil and get at all your personal assets. Yes. And Dewan, the veil is pierced 50% of the time, meaning people are not taking these very simple steps uh, to protect their personal assets. And so that's what the whole book is about, is horror stories of people who didn't protect themselves and then positive steps you can take. Because most a lot of people have formed online. <clears throat> they don't know this rule that they, they have to follow the formalities. No one told them that rule. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to learn it yourself. And that's what the book offers. Nice. And you know, I love about that because I use my dad as an example. So my dad's 84 years old. And so back when he was about 70, 72, he worked for the power company. Um, my stepmom worked for General Motors. They had the retirement, all the stuff. And then he calls me one day. He's like, you know, based on the money, we're going to run out of money. And I'm like, dad, you need to buy some rentals. So he goes out, and God bless him. He went down to Dayton, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, went to the courthouse steps. They bought six rentals. 
he puts it on his personal name. And I said, no, no, no. He goes, I have a $1 million umbrella policy. I'm just like, okay, dad, listen, I totally get that you don't really understand 100% of what I do. I'm telling you that won't work. So here's my dad. At this point, he's like 72. He's got eight rentals and his own home. Everything in his personal name with this million dollar umbrella policy that he thinks is going to protect him. And I'm like, okay, we have to do hard stop right now. And I got to fix this for you. But most people, I feel like most people, even investors, think that as long as they have this umbrella policy or they have this or they have that, they're protected. I'm like, listen, if you run over the neighbor's cat and they sue you for a million dollars, they're going to take all your stuff. Well, you're a good daughter, Duan, to, to do that for your dad, <laughs> because a lot of people would just let it go. Uh, but yeah, you need to have these LLCs set up and properly maintained because the umbrella policy, I always recommend people get an umbrella policy. I mean, that's that's good to have. But these insurance companies have economic incentives to not cover every claim. They don't want to cover every claim. They're going to find a reason not to. Yep. And that's why you need these LLCs on title as the second line of defense. So I'm preaching to the choir. So we're going to help you, um, people understand that because, you know, I've been investing, uh, gosh, I hate to even show my age. I've been investing for over 30 years now. And when I first started out, I did things in my personal name. And then back in the day, I think people were using, I remember when LLCs sort of kind of became like the thing. And we had right. everything in some kind of other, maybe S Corp or something. Well, limited partnerships well, were big. Yeah. And yeah. then we switched to LLCs. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is so much work. I don't know why I'm doing all this. But now I understand it. I'm like, thank God that I got some good advice back then. But people think like, well, I have only two rentals. I'm fine. I don't need an LLC. I'm like, well, first of all, you need it for tax reasons. You need the write-offs. You need all the stuff. But what does like, so for people that don't know, tell them what an LLC is. An LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. Uh, they were uh, first introduced in Wyoming in 1977. And they're kind of a hybrid between a corporation and a partnership. You have the asset protection of a corporation. You have the tax flexibility of a partnership. And with an LLC, you can tax it however you want. It can be as taxed as a C corp, an S corp, uh, a partnership, a disregarded entity. So it's really a flexible doc uh, entity. Uh -huh. And in some states like Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware, they offer superior asset protection. Meaning, if you get in that car wreck and your umbrella policy doesn't cover you or whatever, and they're coming after your other assets. If they have to fight through a Wyoming LLC to get at the other LLCs, they're not going to get very far. No. And so we we just want to put that protection in place to dissuade the attorneys out there who are on a contingency. They get paid when they collect. If they have to run up against Wyoming LLCs, that's not a good use of their time. They're better off with a case that has more insurance money. So we always recommend that you have that insurance. You you know, as a responsible you landlord. It. Yeah, you need to have it still. You need to have the insurance. I mean, you don't want your tenants to get hurt. You want to have insurance. Exactly. But if people are going to be going after you in, in frivolous cases or car wreck cases, you want that Wyoming LLC blocking them from yes. reaching your other real estate. And Wyoming, Nevada, and Delaware are really good at that. They, they are. And, you know, I, I remember the day... I remember the exact day where I thought like, wow, I need to make sure I have everything really protected. And this was back decades ago when that woman drove through McDonald's and ordered hot coffee and spelled the hot coffee. She just ordered hot coffee, put it in her lap, and she sued and won millions of dollars from McDonald's. And I was like, wow, if you can drive through and order hot coffee and then sue for the hot coffee... I need to make sure, and I remember that day calling my attorney and said, listen, I need to make sure every single solitary thing known to man I have is covered because McDonald's, who has a big corporation, just lost like a million dollars for scalding hot coffee. That's like, it's not like she asked for iced tea. She asked for <laughs> hot coffee. <laughs> well, and she put it in her lap, you know. And she, I mean, lap and she drove in the car. It's like, Right, what? you know, she I hit a bump. McDonald's That's McDonald's fault. fault. No, that was a big day in the world of asset protection. It when was. that case came out, it, people went, wait a minute. It, I can be sued for anything in this country. Yeah. Do you remember what year that was? 
Oh, uh, gosh, I don't. Not early 90s? It was the early 90s. It was somewhere in the early 90s because I remember just being really shook about that because I already owned a couple rentals. I was like, okay, that's it. I'm a single mom. I got a kid. I own rentals. And she just won a million dollars at McDonald's. What would happen at for me? Right. I don't have a corporation like McDonald's, attorneys like that. And it was. And that's when LLCs, like as far as I knew in the real estate part of it, they were really becoming like the thing was in the early 90s. So I back then, I jumped on that whole protection bandwagon and I've stayed on it for 30 years. And I meet people all over. They say, oh, yeah, I bought a house. It's only once in my name. I'm just like. Yeah. So I'm going to start saying, you need to call Garrett right now. That's right. So, yeah, we had a case like that where uh, a lady in San Francisco was at a uh, an event that I uh, was speaking at. Uh -huh. And she came up to me. She would bought a duplex. And uh, she said, you know. I'd like to put it in an LLC. I go, well, in the state of California, the annual fee is $800 a year. And wow. she goes, oh, I can't afford that. And then I see her at the next event and she comes up to me and says, you know, I've been sued by my tenant. I'd like to set up that LLC now. It's too late. If you've been sued when title's in your individual name, it's too late. So you need to set these entities up right at the start. Right at the start. You do. I do. And I, I and that's one thing I always... I do a lot of workshops, like events like you do. And I see people and they say, oh, I'm going to wait until I get my LLC. I don't have any money. I can't start my business yet. It's like, listen, get a deal, wholesale a deal, do something to get the money and get LLCs. And you got to just stay protected because you can sue people for literally anything today. Like yeah. we have become so sue happy. And you know that as an attorney, you know that. We have I become do. So sue happy. You can sue people for anything. And, and it and, happens. And they do lives. sue. They do sue for anything. And so, you know, uh, you run into people who say, well, I've never been sued before. And I feel like I will never, ever be sued. <laughs> and, too. you know, and then you talk to them two years later and, oh, my gosh, they've been sued and they've taken a, a, a good chunk of their yep. personal assets. When yeah. It's not expensive to set these up. It's not expensive yeah. to maintain them. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just have to consider it as another form of insurance. When exactly. you invest in real estate, you need the right insurance, both from an insurance company and from the entities that you set up. Yeah. Um, and you guys also, if someone works with you, you set up the LLCs, um, I'm assuming, and then yep. you maintain them every year and do all the filings for them. So they can just like do a one and done and they don't have to worry about it again. Right. Right. So we'll be the registered agent. We'll do the minutes. We'll make sure that the annual filings are done with the state. Right. So, I mean, you do what you do best, which is go out, find properties, rehab them, fix them up, find tenants, and we'll help you. We'll be a team member yeah. and we'll take care of your LLCs and corporations. I, I tell everyone that. I'm like, listen, you need an investor friendly real estate agent. You need a good title company. You need an attorney to do Because, you know, for a I think for a regular, even a smaller investor, just does a few deals a year, trying to maintain the LLCs, do all the filings, keep up with everything. It maybe feels a little daunting for people because it's legal. And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's legal. What if I do it wrong? And it's like, but if you don't do it at all, you're going to get sued. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you have that LLC and you haven't followed the formalities, you haven't paid the state, you haven't had a meeting, uh, a good attorney can pierce right through it. Yeah, and get at your personal assets. So, you know, it's not hard to follow these formalities. If you're averse to doing it, we provide a service where you can. Uh, so yeah. it, it shouldn't be a big burden on anyone. I know a lot of people are, you know, do it yourselfers and that's fine. But if you're going to do it yourself with an online service and set up that LLC, they don't tell you that you've got to transfer title from your name into the name of the LLC. Um, a lot of people get scared of, by the due on sale clause where you transfer yeah. title from your name into the LLC and they, they're worried that the bank is going to call the note. Uh, but here's the thing. You haven't sold the property. There's no sale. You're just transferring it from you to you. And it, it's not a sale. So they're not going to call the note. And here's the thing with the banks. Here's I, the I can magic. Just stop it right there, real quick. Yeah. On that note, I tell people all the time. They say, "Well, the bank will call the due on." I, everyone fears. Okay, I've been doing this thirty years. Have you ever seen any bank call the due on sale clause? Never. 
Okay, never. never either, ever. Not in 30 full years. I say, listen, take the house, deed it to the LLC. Oh, we'll call the deal on sale. I'm like, but you didn't, all you have to say is I'm doing it for asset protection. It's not against the law to take your own house that you live in and put it into an LLC to protect you. Right. You that wise. Well, You're not, there's no do on sale and everyone. And I, so I'm so happy you said those exact words because I'm going to make a little one minute snip of you saying on repeat, you're selling it to yourself. It's not a sale. It's not do on sale. It's just That's a transfer. It. And here's the magic language, Duan. <laughs> if, if, if your people are talking to the banks and I agree with you completely, I've never seen a bank call the note when you transfer it into an LLC. The bank's position is enhanced with it in an LLC, in fact. But here's the magic language, continuity of obligation. And what that means is the bank, when you transfer from your name into the LLC, the bank still has your personal guarantee. That doesn't go away. The bank still has their first deed of trust against the property. That doesn't go away. So there's this continuing obligation on your part to pay the bank. And I would argue that the bank is in a better position with title in an LLC. That means that there's less likely going to be any litigation, right? And so the bank is in first position. They don't want that title challenged no. by somebody suing. So having title in the LLC is really better for the bank. Their position hasn't changed. They still have the personal guarantee. They still have the first deed of trust and it's less likely that you're gonna be sued. So. Uh, again, I wrote it all down. Around. I'm going to start preaching continuity of obligation. So I've never heard that from an attorney's point of view, that the continuity of obligation, because they still have the homeowner signature, right? Protecting themselves from all the crazy people that are out there. Continuity of obligation. I okay, when you said that, I'm like, okay, I'm writing that down verbatim. That's <laughs> my new catchphrase. Right. So I'm like, oh, what about the doing sound like? Continuity of obligation. That's what Garrett told me. <laughs> That's the magic language. But it is, it is because we're allowed to put our properties into trusts, family trusts, land trusts, you know, living trusts, whatever LLCs, we're allowed to do that. It doesn't sure. necessarily mean that you change the title, you're just changing the, the protection of it. But people don't even realize they should have their own house that they live in in an LLC. Yeah, or a homestead. The homestead exemption protects you pretty well too. Like in Texas mm -hmm. and Florida, it's unlimited. Meaning right. someone, a later creditor suing to get the equity in your house can't under Texas and Florida law. Uh, Nevada law protects 600,000 in equity. So you have a million dollar house with a $400,000 first on it. There's 600,000 in equity that someone could reach after a car wreck. By filing this simple form with the county uh, and paying a filing fee for $20, that 600,000 is removed. It's for your benefit. And so the homestead is a very inexpensive and bulletproof way to go. Now, some states don't have the homestead. They don't. We have a house in Florida and I have that. So I know that's safe there, but not yeah. all the states have that. Well, and it's only for your primary residence. So you can only use it once, even though you have houses all across the country, you only get one homestead. And, you know, Texas, Florida, Oklahoma, those are good states. Um, another thing to note, uh, Duan, when you transfer title from your name into the LLC, you have to let the insurance company know that title is in the LLC. And uh, because there have been cases where the insurance company, again, trying to avoid responsibility, says, well, geez, we thought we were insuring you personally. We didn't know we were insuring an LLC and they'll deny coverage. So here's how you skin the cat. You say, okay, if the premium is going to be more expensive, if it's in the name of the LLC, leave the premium in my name and list the LLC as an additional insured. And that way you'll be covered. You'll have the lower premium, but you'll also have your LLC being insured in case there's a problem. I love talking to you because all the things I teach people, it's like, I'm teaching it all right. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, I have a lot of people that have their houses in LLC, they're yeah. in foreclosure, and I'll just have them, uh, you know, just assign the LLC over to me, or I'll buy the LLC, and not buy the actual house, but I'll buy the LLC that contains the house, and that helps get around, you know, banks on short sales and, and stuff like that, because technically, 
they didn't transfer the deed. They just sold me their LLC that right. happens to own the house. And I'm yeah. like, listen, just add it on as an additional insured. Like, it's so simple. And people make the biggest deals about those couple of things. Like, it well, and stops people from doing deals. Well, exactly. And then you have all this information out there about land trusts. Land trusts offer no asset protection. You know, and all these promoters are out there selling the land trust is the greatest. It's not. There's no asset protection. And so you have to be really careful about what type of advice you take yeah. uh, because some people are just out there to sell and you really need to get good advice from your attorney, yes. from your team, uh, you know, before you make a mistake, like putting property into a land trust and thinking you're protected. Yeah, no, I know. And it, it, it's so true. And that the biggest problem, I, this is just my personal opinion, but I think one of the things I love and hate about the internet is everything's at your fingertips, but you don't right. know if it's good information or bad information. Right. So people go, right. oh, hey, look, there's an attorney that's like, can do this for $49. And then you do it. It's like, and I was like, oh, wait, this other guy, wow, he charges a thousand. I can't afford that. And it's right there. But it's like, and I always tell people, listen, if you're going to work with anybody, first of all, listen to them on my show. If not, if you find them on your own, research, find out, make sure they're not selling a program. Because there's a difference between people selling programs and people actually like you helping them and you become a long-term team member. There's right. like two completely different people. So I always warn people, like, just make sure you're not working with someone that's a good marketer because a marketer doesn't follow up on the back end. And then you go get this LLC or whatever you get, or you do land trust or whatever you do. And then when, you know, push comes to shove, you still get sued. Right. Right. And it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned the ninety nine dollar promotion. Uh, we've tested those and, you know, it's a bait and switch. Yeah. Come on in for ninety nine dollars. But then the whole package costs fifteen hundred dollars and we're charging half that, you know. Yeah. And, and so it just you just have to be very cautious on the Internet. It's like the old joke. Uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln said you can't trust anything on the Internet. <laughs> and that's true and you know there's kids today you know there's kids today that didn't do their history that are like Abe Lincoln said that really because they don't know they don't even know who he is yeah uh, if you quote anybody from the past all the young kids just stare at you with this blank face because they have no idea who you're talking about well they don't teach much anymore unfortunately <laughs> I so. know they don't they really don't it's really sad my, my grandkids happen to go to a private school and it's a private Christian school I mean, those kids are already learning states and presidents and history. And my seven-year-old can literally spout everything. And I'm just like, where are you learning all that at seven years old? But this school teaches like. That's great. Everything. Well, that's a good school. It is a good school. She's, the, the stuff she knows, it's, it's shocking to me because, I mean, maybe I learned things that young. I don't remember. But I know my daughter didn't learn things that quite that early. But they teach them a lot about history and she knows a lot about histories and presidents and she can talk about the government. And I'm just like, who are you right now? You're well, seven. I'm happy to hear that because <laughs> uh, a lot of people, younger people I talk to, and I, I'm not saying this against all younger people. They're, they're, they're some totally great kids out there. But, yeah. you know, you just talk to some of them about the government and they just have no sense that there are three separate branches and the what the U.S. Supreme Court does versus the executive branch. It's just, it's, it's tough. But anyway. I got a D and I, in high school, I got a D in civics class. So I just, I was 16. There were a lot of boys. I was allowed to date. And I was interested in boys and not the teacher. I got a D. I remember getting a D and thinking, oh, who needs that government stuff anyway? But then later, I was like, you know what? I do need to know that. So I had to relearn all that and teach it to myself because I literally, my first D in my whole life, I got it in civics class. <laughs> I was like, there must have been some cute. Stuff? There must have been some cute boys in that there class. There were some you. cute boys. And I was like, who cares about that? Like, I'm never going to need to care about the government. <laughs> well, you know, you're 17, you live in a country, you know. And then right. you, you know, you're like, oh, I do care who the president is. <laughs> I actually do care about that. So, yeah, and they, they, kids just, they need to know more. So can I ask you, how old are you, Garrett? I am 69 years old. 69, 69 and looking fine. Thank you. There you go. So let's, let's kind of back up a little bit. So I'm 63, so I'm, I'm in the group there with wow. you. Wow, so, great. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm 63 and that doesn't rhyme with fine, but you know, okay. So 63 and pretty, pretty, I don't know. Feeling we'll free. work on that. 63 and feeling free. And Good. 69 and looking fine. 
I come up with something every year on my birthday. So it's like, well, I'm in my 60s now. I got to come up with something. Um, so back when you were young, like what was the Garrett that was like a teenager, 13, 14, 15? Where were you living? What were you doing? Oh, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area in the Oakland Hills and uh, went to a, you know, a good high school. It's a public high school, but uh -huh, me too. Know, ni 95% of the kids went to college. It was one of those kind of schools. Wow. And uh, so, you know, still in touch with my high school friends. We just had a, a great class. Uh -huh. And uh, then I went off to college and, you know, played uh, rugby and, uh, you know, went then went to law school in San Francisco and played rugby and studied and you know right. it was it, so it you was want good. to be an attorney like all when you were young did you think I'm gonna be an attorney someday well my dad was a judge in Oakland and so uh you know at the dining room table I'd learn about his cases and the law and so it was just kind of a natural mm -hmm. thing um that sounds interesting though that'd be fun a dinner conversation Oh, yeah. Well, that's kind of where I learned asset protection. My dad would say, gosh, this guy had a sole proprietorship. He could have been a corporation, but he was a sole proprietor and he lost everything. So wow. I learned early on about asset protection at the dining room table. You know, that's really interesting because I grew up in the country. Like we lived on a farm in the country and we were like at dinner time. OK, who's going to go out there and hold the garden? <laughs> no one ever <laughs> mentioned the word asset protection. I don't think my dad knew what it was. So he was 70. And, you know, I didn't know until I was older as well. So so that's kind of neat. So you played rugby, so you must be good at it. Well, that was back in the day. I would say it was good. But, you know, that the stories get better over the years. So. They do. I know. They get better and you get better. You're like, oh, I was the best player on the entire team. <laughs> <laughs> so you were always kind of interested in being an attorney. So did you start right out of the gate? Like, I'm going to work with real estate investors. I'm going to do asset protection. Was that like your natural right no. out of the gate? No, I started with a, a firm in Oakland and, you know, they did transactional work and, and corporate work. And so I learned there and then I went to Washington, D.C. and practiced there with a big firm. And uh, that was interesting, uh, you know, to see how the big firms can help shape the regulations. Uh -huh. uh, the most important thing on the desk was the Rolodex. You know, everybody was what connected is. there. Um, and then I practiced uh, back in San Francisco and moved to Reno uh, because I spent all my summers at Lake Tahoe. I enjoy skiing. Uh -huh. And so Reno has been a great place for me. It's a Nevada is a great state to set up a corporation or an LLC. Yeah. And I moved up here single and that where got you live married. Now? What's that? Is that where you live now in Nevada? I live in Reno, right. Oh, Reno. I love Reno. Yeah. What do they and call it? The biggest little town or something? Biggest little city in the world. And yeah. with all the Californians moving in, it's getting even bigger. <laughs> I, <bet>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know all the people in California, they're like, oh, my God, we hate our state. Every 10th oh. license plate here is a California plate. Is it? Oh, yeah. It's just incredible how many people are moving in. But that's true around the West. It is. It is. Yeah. I know. But California is like in such a hot mess out there. I think they're just like, OK, this used to be the greatest place to live. But now it's like overrun with you know everything the homeless the drugs it's so overrun with everything and, and i know a lot of people that i know people that live there they're like we're out right and so yeah reno is a great place oh next time i come up there and do a workshop at reno we're gonna have lunch there we go so that's nice so you've been working with investors how many decades at this point have you been working with investors oh you know 30 years nice. 30 years and it really accelerated when i became associated with robert kiyosaki in in the year 2000 so we've been, you know, working on uh, helping protect rich dad devotees, you know, protect their real estate, because Robert always suggests that you invest in real estate. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, it's it's been fun watching people who, you know, maybe 15 years ago were just getting started, knew they had to invest in real estate. We helped set up the LLCs and you get on the phone with them 10 years later. And they've got, you know, 50 properties and they're doing great. I love yeah. hearing those stories. Yeah, I do too. Yep. I do too. Yeah, I, I, I like Robert. I follow him. Back a long time ago, uh, he used to speak at the Learning Annex and my husband and I did too. So I've been to a couple of parties and just met him a few times, like, you know, sort of in passing. But I always, I love the book about the one with the quadrants. Yeah, the cash flow quadrant. Yeah, yeah, and that's just because it, it's so good to show someone like, hey, listen, here it is. Where are you at in this quadrant? And then people don't realize that they're running a business, but they're really like a worker. They're, they're yeah. not letting everything work over here. They're doing it all. 
Right. Right. And you, you know, uh, the, the S quadrant, the, the self-employed, uh, Robert calls it high paid manual labor. I mean, you it just is. have to keep going into work and instead of buying real estate and allowing that money to generate for you when you retire, a lot of these people at the end, they've, they've had their own business, but they don't have any assets that will keep continuing to produce. And it's, it's really a rough wake up call when you realize at the end of your career, you haven't taken any steps I know. to provide a continu you know, some sort of continuing cash flow. Yeah, no, that was the phone call I got from my dad. They had this great retirement from General Motors, you know, Social Security, all the stuff. But it's all in, you know, mutual funds and stuff. And they're like, we're going to run out of money. And I was like, let's get some rentals. Oh, you know, I don't know. But then they got them and then they'd go putter around and fix it up and rent it. And that, for 15 years, they were busy puttering on their rentals all the time. But it's true because I think unless you either are exposed to it or know about it or you're taught that, you don't realize that stuff until you end up and you're 60 years old. You're like, holy cow, I really can't ever stop working. Right. Well, and my dad, as, as a judge, never bought real estate. I didn't learn about it. Yeah. And he had a, a state of California pension. The judge's pension was pretty good, although I wouldn't rely on it, you know, 20 years from now. They, they don't have the money to fund all the promises they've made. They don't. But, you know, you work for the government or you work for yourself. You've got to take steps yeah. to generate that passive income for your retirement, because uh, a yeah. lot of these pensions are not going to be there or they're going to be 20 percent of what they promised. I know. And so many people are like, oh, I get my pinch on my social security. I'll be good. It's like, but like, honestly, is even social security going to really be there? Like, I don't even know. Like, what, $20 trillion in debt. Like, is that even really going to be there? So right. I just raise my kids like, listen, you're going to work for yourselves right out of the gate and you're going to own rentals and you're going to own, they all own rentals, properties, commercial. Like, there's no other path for you. You're going to own stuff. And, right. you know, you know they're kids. So out of high school, like, well, we want to do this and that. I'm like, I don't care what you want to do. You're going to buy stuff. You're going to own it. And now they're in their 30s. They're like, thank God you made us invest when we were in our 20s. I'm like, well, just glad you didn't wait till you were 60. <laughs> you know? No, that's great. I want my kids to do that, too. Uh, you know, and they don't listen to the old man. I was fortunate to be able to take some the, the kids on some tours internationally with Robert Kiyosaki. Nice. So they're sitting there listening to him. And he's yeah. quizzing them. And, you know, that was the greatest education ever. And now they are just, they have the mindset that they're going to be investing in real estate like yep. your kids. They do. And we used to do a lot of three-day workshops. So I know my kids won't listen to me. So I'd make them go listen to other people. Like you're going to work this workshop. And I'm, when they're speaking, you're going to listen. Then you'll be at the back table in the breaks. They learn from other people and be like, well, you guys. And I'm like, Okay, we've literally taught you that, what you just heard. We've already said that 2,000 times, but they just need to hear it from somebody. Not, you know, a fresh set of ears. That's it. You know, I mean, we've been on them all, all these years. So why would they listen to us about investing? But, <laughs> exactly. you know, as long as you can get someone else out there that they can uh, believe in and trust, I, I think yeah. that whatever works to get them in the mindset yeah. of investing and, and, you know, Robert's game, the cash flow uh, game, you know, that's a good game to play yeah. for the kids to learn. I played it with my kids when they were teenagers. Yeah. So I played it with my know, son. Whatever it he, takes. He was like 13 or 14. He's got, my son has like a really crazy math mind. And really like, his, even his teachers are like, I don't know where he gets it from. He just, any, you can give him any equation. He just goes, it gives you the answer. Like, it's so crazy. So uh, when he was like 14, he used to beat me at the cash flow game. Yep. <laughs> How are you beating me right now? And he's like, you know, because he's not emotionally attached to the, you know, the game. He's like, he's playing it. And it's like, it's good though. But I'm happy that they're all in their 30s and that they're doing that now. So that makes it. So now, if someone is listening and they're like, hey, you know what? I really, I want to invest. I'm working with whoever, Dwan, Kiyosaki, whoever, and I really do need LLCs and stuff. If they just reach out to you on the CorporateDirect.com. And you'll help them in any state. Now, do you give them a Wyoming corporation regardless of what state they're in? No, it depends on your situation. A lot of times what we'll do is say you've got a property in Ohio and okay. you've got a property in South Carolina. We'd have an Ohio LLC and a South Carolina LLC for each property. And then those two LLCs would be owned by one Wyoming LLC. 
And that's typically how we structure it. So that if you get in the car wreck, the outside attack, it has nothing to do with the real estate. They want to get at the two properties. They have to sue and fight through the Wyoming LLC, which says the only thing you can get is what's called a charging order, which is a lien on distribution. So until you distribute something to yourself and the car wreck victim can get it at that point, you know, you're not going to make any distributions. And so the person is sitting around waiting. And for the attorney who's on a contingency fee, you know, they only get paid when they collect. Yeah. Having to fight through a Wyoming LLC is just not a good use of their time. They're better off going for the next case that has insurance money. So that's how we like to structure it. I like that. So I need to do that because I don't have the Wyoming LLC. Right. So you would have a couple have LLCs. Because I've got yeah. all these LLCs. I need to have like a mother. There's like a motherboard that like does it yeah. down. So I'm missing that single step right there. And I always thought it was the Nevada or the Delaware corpse that were like the main one that you should have. But you're saying the Wyoming one. I like Wyoming. When you, when you compare them, they all offer good asset protection. Uh, but Wyoming and uh, rather Nevada and Delaware are 350 a year. Wyoming's only $62 a year and they don't list your name on the state website. So oh, that's some good privacy there. That is good. Yes. Cause the thing is when that's why I always tell people, it's like, listen, when someone is going to like these attorneys that work on contingencies, they're going to put the person's name. And if they see they own 10 rentals, and they see this guy owns none and you want to you want to sue. They're going to go after the guy with the rentals, not the person that has nothing because they don't get paid unless they win. So Correct. they do look it up. That's why I'm like, keep your name out of the public records. If people don't see that you own anything, there's nothing to take from you. Well, and they're private investigators who just with a click of a, you know, a mouse can find out what you own. And so to have a low profile uh, is better than to have your name on 10 different properties in town. I went, I went to speak one day and, uh, it was in Florida and I, the guy, in the, so I was in like a two day workshop and the guy in the audience goes, I looked you up on the public records and you don't own anything. And you're talking all this big talk. And I said, I don't own anything. Here's nothing. And I said, that's right. This is all protected. So he was Good like, for me, sister. exactly. He was going to call me out. And I was like, yay, you couldn't find me on the public record. I'm free. I'm safe. And everybody started laughing. But this guy thought he had like some big, like, you know, how are you preaching over and you don't own anything? Well, like, everybody's got this gotcha mentality out there, but you you trumped him with that because that's that's the way you want to be. Yeah. You, like, you don't nothing? want people to be able to see that you have all these assets all over the place. I was like, you couldn't find one thing. He's like, I've been searching. And I was thinking, like, who takes that much time to do that to call the speaker out? I was like, there's nothing, not one thing. He said, like, nothing. I was like, if I start clapping and the guys look confused, I'm like, hey, I'm just, you. No one can sue me, and everybody then starts clapping with me because they're getting it, you know. Yeah. And it's like that right there. That's why you need asset protection. <laughs> That's a good story. I was like, who wants to call someone out like that anyway? It's like I don't know. The guy was, I don't even know why he would do that, but he had some kind of attitude about me all weekend, and I was just like, hey, dude, you spend all the time you want, you're gonna find me anywhere. So I was <laughs> super excited about that. Okay, so I always like to give the audience like one actionable tip. What's one actionable tip that someone could take that would help them get going in the right direction? Well, one actionable tip would be to contact us at Corporate Direct and set up a free 15-minute consultation with one of the account reps and just go through your situation. I mean, maybe you need that Wyoming LLC. You haven't taken that step. Uh, maybe you've set up three LLCs, but you've got two properties that you haven't included in LLCs. You need to take that step. We don't want to put 10 to 20 properties in one LLC. If someone sues, they could get the equity in all 10. That's so right. maybe you've put too many in one LLC and, we, and it's easy to transfer them out into new LLCs. It's not a taxable event or anything. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe you've got uh, five properties in one LLC, and it might make sense to do three and two. So we can help you with that as well. Okay. And I like the fact they can get a free 15 minute phone call. Cause I mean, you and I have talked for half an hour and, and you've answered a million questions. So someone could get a lot of information, in, you know, in 15 minutes, it's like, Oh, I don't want to spend a bunch of money. They could still get a lot of good information. Well, and we'll send you a quote out. I mean, you know, we'll look at your structure, what you have, 
And then we'll send you a chart that we suggest with a quote, what it costs at the start. And then the next year, everything drops down. There's no formation yeah. fee. Nice. It's not expensive to maintain these things. And again, it's just another form of insurance. I can't always, I swear, I feel like I just preach all the time. I just protect yourself, protect yourself, protect yourself. If you would just watch the news for one second, everybody's suing everybody all the time. It's like everything. It's like, oh my God, people protect yourselves. The world has gone crazy, Garrett. It has, but we have the, the, the government gives us a way to protect ourselves. You know, <laughs> they let attorneys sue on a contingency, but they let us set up LLCs to protect against that. So not crazy. I think I read like 90%, 95% of all the lawsuits in the world are in the United States. That That's true. Is that true? But it's kind of, there's an interesting story that litigation has increased in Sweden for some reason. Really? And in Sweden, they call this increase in litigation, the American disease. So, oh my gosh, I'm writing that down. That's how popular we are over there. I did not know that. You know, we were in Korea like a decade ago. And we were in um, the, the Dongdae Moon uh, Wholesale District in Korea. So we're sitting there, me and my husband and my kids, we're sitting in this window on this busy, like, five-way intersection. And everybody drives those little mopeds with boxes stacked, like, 80 feet high. And they're all flying. And we're sitting in the Burger King looking out the window. And this guy turns a corner in a moped. And this guy in a van, they hit. All the boxes fly everywhere. So we're watching. I'm sitting there watching. And, and I put on my camera. And the guy gets out of the van. The guy in the moped, he ducked them off. They restack the boxes, they retie them, and they shake hands and they laugh. And I was like, okay, in America, it'd be like, oh, my back, oh, oh, oh. And there'd be cops, there'd be an ambulance, people would be laying out on the floor, dusted each other off, and off they went. Like nothing happened. I thought, you will never, ever see that happen in America. That would not happen in this country. The people would immediately be calculating how much they could collect immediately and we yeah. were sitting there and even my kids they're teenagers they're like they just dusted each other off and restacked and they just shook hands and left it's like no right. car, you're laying insurance i said no that's because everyone in america sued oh the swedes are calling us american disease i get it <laughs> i do get it <laughs> okay so we're gonna jump topics for a minute so tell me what's your favorite band of all time beatles oh i like the beatles too followed by steely dan but beatles oh i like steely dan too I'm right down both. Yeah, Beatles are good. I love the Beatles, too. So you're just a little bit older than me. I was a little bit more uh, the Beatles because, you know, we're only like, you know, seven, a few years apart. But I was a little bit more still into like the Osmonds and the Jackson 5. And the Beatles yeah. more as I was a little bit older. I was like, oh, my God, I love the Beatles. So well, Beatles I've educated my kids. When we, Whenever we travel, we would put in a Beatles CD and, that you know, now they love the Beatles. So oh, yeah, I think my kids do. I think it's going to be a generational thing where it'll continue. It does. My kids know every Beatles song that there is. My girls yeah. even, they love the Beatles so much. They've gone over to England and done all the walks on the street. You know, all went to all the four Beatles houses and the whole thing. I'm like, girls. I said, <laughs> and they cry. It's like, oh, my God, this is so cute. All right, yeah. what's your favorite food? Food? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple. I mean... I generally That's like fun. Mexican food. Well, okay, let's just say Mexican cuisine. Okay, I like Mexican. Okay, Mexican is good. And what is your favorite part of the day? What's your favorite time of day? Oh, I get up at 4.30, have a cup of coffee, and do my writing. So you are a more, a solid morning I am morning a person. real morning person. You are a good morning person. Okay, so I took notes. So I like to do a little bit of a review. So we call this session... Inside the minds of today's millionaires. And I just try to, like we did, just talk and get to know each other and not make it all just like, you know, this is what, you know, just to have some fun. And uh, so I'm going to do a little review and you can tell me if I figured out a little bit about who Garrett Sutton is today. So first of all, you're 69, looking fine. Uh, your book, Bail Not Fail. So we'll have to put your book up again before we, we end for the day. Or you can hold it up while I'm doing this. Corporate attorney, rich dad advisor, you basically help you with LLCs and corporations, corporatedirect.com. And you, when you were younger, San Francisco, your dad was a judge, which made super interesting dinner talk, I could only imagine. And then got into college and played rugby and did corporate work, went to DC, worked some big firms, and then got in, heavily involved 
with real estate investors for the whole last 30 years and your LLC uh, motto when people want to take their homes out of their name, put into an LLC, is continuing of obligation. I learned a new phrase I'm going to use forever. And um, people can contact you at, uh, hold on, corporatedirect.com for a free 15-minute consultation. You like the Beatles, you like Mexican food, and you like very much the mornings. And you have an awesome book, Veil Not Fail, that is out and released. And people can go and grab a copy of it right now today. That's right. Is that a little <laughs> bit inside the mind, a little bit That's, of Garrett? You did a great job. I didn't get time to ask you about all your kids and grandkids, but we'll just assume everything's amazing. Okay, so uh, everyone, I just want to, first of all, I always want to thank you for being on to the show today, Garrett, and everyone listening. You know, podcast is definitely a labor of love. And if you learned something today, you had a good time today, I want you to subscribe, leave a five-star review, write a review. And on the days where I podcast just by myself, I might read your five-star review, but you have to leave one first. And you have to go to Dwanderful, D-W-A-N-D-E-R-F-U-L, Dwanderful.com and opt in. I have four free eBooks. So I took Dwan and the word wonderful and I made a new word. So I like it. <laughs> That's easy. It's like wonderful. It's yeah. Uh, it's wonderful.com and get your four free books. Okay. Last thing is I want you to leave us with a parting word of wisdom, but it can only actually be a single word. Integrity. I love it. I don't think anyone's ever used that word before. Okay, so guys, the word of the week. Well, the word of your lifetime needs to be integrity. Because integrity, in my opinion, this is what I think. Integrity is doing things right even when nobody else is watching. Right. Is that what you think integrity means? Uh, I agree. Okay. I agree. Always, it's a way to live your life. It is a way. Because you know, God's always watching. So you can't just like oh no one saw me do that so I, so that i always like to ask the guests what integrity what they what it means to them and so i'm glad that you you feel the same because that's what i feel i tell my kids all the time you have to live like an integrous life because everything you do even when people aren't watching is still what forms your personality it does if you think i can get away with it in private but in public i have to be this great person you're really not living who you are right right you know? integrity i, I love it. you're the first one that's used that word and that's one of my favorite words. I tell my kids all the time, if you do nothing in your life, learn how to be in, have integrity. It's more important than anything. We need uh, integrity in this country right now. Boy, we do, don't we? Yep. Jeez. Okay. All right. So, uh, folks, remember, we'll be back. And Garrett, don't run off. I want to talk to you for a second after we click off the page here. So, everyone, remember, we'll be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. And remember that the truth is in the red letter. Okay, everybody. Thank you, Garrett. Ciao.